And the woman I'm going to start with is Jeannie McPherson, who is also a famous uh, silent film screenwriter of that period, as famous as Marion was in her own day. Forgotten much in the history books uh, because she wrote for Cecil B. DeMille. She wrote all the films that he made that made money. Uh, as she was also one of his three mistresses. And so textbooks tell you she was his mistress and they forget the part where she wrote the movies that made him money. Yes, so I love Jeannie. Uh, and, and I borrowed this title from this play, which I love, Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike. Just seemed to suit me perfectly, but I wanted to credit the author. I did not make up the title. Uh, I'm Roseanne Welch. I am working with Stevens College, which is in Missouri, but we run our MFA programs in Los Angeles, so it confuses everybody because I live in LA, I don't live in Missouri. Um, our theme of our program is Write, Reach, and Represent, which of course suits everything that everyone's been talking about today. I'm very excited about that. My background is that I came from being a television screenwriter and wrote on uh, all these shows, and then came into academia and was like, how are people learning how to do this? Because not everybody's very good at it. Uh, and then I've written on these various books. Thank you for mentioning Rimmer on Hollywood, which has chapters on Jeannie and many of these other women we can talk about. Uh, I also am the book review editor for Journal Screenwriting, so if you want to review a book, you have a book that needs reviewing, let me know, because we always need more reviews, all right? So that's a good thing. And we're here doing global screenwriting. So we'll start back with Jeannie McPherson. This is Jeannie McPherson, and yes, that's a picture of her with Cecil B. DeMille. So this is mostly where you see her photographs in the world. She was also an aviator, and several years ago at a conference, I saw a marvelous presentation on how women are always there at the beginning of a new thing, like the Wild West, and women aviators in America and all over the world were doing flying until it became a job that made money. And then suddenly women couldn't be hired to fly anymore, and you had to have had uh, experience in the military where they hadn't allowed women to fly. So suddenly you couldn't be a pilot anymore and certainly couldn't be an astronaut until they broke that rule. So same thing happened in early Hollywood. All these women are working like crazy and then suddenly it becomes the system and they're all slowly petered out. Uh, often it was because the movie, uh, the movie moguls offered them new contracts. After 20 years of working as screenwriters and being their own directors and casting, they were offered, um, they were offered contracts as junior writers to work with men who would teach them how to do it. And to that they said, I'm going home and writing my own novel. So they, and they didn't know that by doing that, they pulled themselves out of the history, and therefore we're archaeologically discovering all of them. So she wrote uh, just a little bit in this piece that was published um, all about her theories of screenwriting. Many other women of the day had written in this. And what's interesting is Emilio Cecchi came to the States to study how Hollywood did film so he could bring that to Cinecittà and make some money in Italy. And he had a daughter named Suso Cecchi di Bici, and she became the core screenwriter in the world of Italian neorealism. She remembered in many interviews that she had read this booklet, as she described it, um, and that the, what she kept in mind were these things that Jeannie had said about screenwriting, the three elements, the crucial moment, the beginning of new, and the end of the first one. Seems pretty basic, but these people were thinking, how do we make movies work? And so this was new ideas to them. So it's a woman taking information from another woman, mentoring her into how she will run her career in an entirely different country, which also I think is lovely to fit into Klaus's theme. Uh, and she remembered that for many years. She was interviewed, uh, and there were oral histories done of her, and she always kept going back to this one thing she'd read from Jeannie McPherson, which I think is beautiful. Uh, Cecchi Dimitri is known as coming up with the ladder or the little staircase, this idea of outlining a film so that it would have steps and you would see the story progress. Seems obvious to us today, but coming from a time when people just grabbed cameras and ran around and did whatever they could take film of, the idea of planning became very important. And so, again, she's taking Jeannie's idea, she's moving it forward. As we know of her, she's key behind several very important Italian neorealism films, starting with The Bicycle Thief. And we're going to see um, how these images match up with some movies in another period, which I'll get to in a second. We know her from that. We also know her from Bellissima, which was one of the earliest movies to look at the movie business, certainly in Italy, and see how it eats people up, chews them and spits them out, which is so sad. So it was a meta film before anyone even had a word for that. Um, and of course, we've seen many films about the film business since then. 
So she had this cynical view of it, which I think is interesting. And then also the miracle of Milan, which was a little interesting. It was neorealistic and a little surreal going on there. Very interesting. She was a very interesting filmmaker. So her work, oh, I have to thank Paolo, who's here today. You'll run into him because he comes to my MFA in, on Zoom right now and does a lecture on neorealism, which is so useful to my students and has taught me so much over the years that I didn't know just from being a kid who liked to watch Italian films with my grandmother, who was from Italy. Um, but... Americans start paying attention because of things like Rome Open City, which is not something that Suso wrote on, but is, of course, a film that was very majorly important here. And we start thinking, oh, how can we incorporate that into our movies? And so it begins with things like On the Waterfront, which most people have seen or heard about, which is really working through uh, the HUAC hearings and who's a stool pigeon and who's not and who gives names. Um, so we start to see the influences come into American films. Marty is considered one of the best examples of that. Um, and I do think this is a beautiful film because we're looking at people who aren't beautiful, people who aren't rich, people who aren't who we think movie stars should be. Um, and I often tell my students, it's hilarious, Ernest Borgnine, they, they know him from being the mermaid man in SpongeBob. The man's career went 80 years. And here he is, they watch Marty, and they're amazed at what a brilliant actor he is, um, playing an Italian-American butcher. So a very unromantic job on top of all that. So we're seeing some of the Italian neorealism come into American films. But interestingly enough, in a place where it's been ignored, it came deeply into the world of the black filmmakers of the 1970s, who felt that they wanted finally to show the world and how harsh it had been in their lives. So we see a lot of that influence come through these movies, which also didn't end up often in mainstream film courses. You had to take a side class, right? And that's a difficult thing. So it's been really important to reincorporate these movies into and to see the progression of how they fit into international world cinema. I think that's really important. So uh, I'm starting with Nothing But a Man, which is a beautiful film, interestingly enough, made by not an African-American filmmaker, um, but considered to have captured the, the struggle quite well. In this, Ivan Dixon plays a railroad worker, and he just moves from state to state, avoiding the Jim Crow South, trying to avoid the treatment that he would receive if he settled into any of these locations. But you see him receive the treatment. So we're dealing with the underpinning of how Americans are treating Americans of color in this time period. And that was very harsh. Um, it's, it's a sad side note. I actually worked with Ivan Dixon's daughter uh, on a show years ago. And he did a show called Hogan's Heroes, which you may or may not have seen in reruns. Um, and it kind of ruined his independent film career because they thought he'd sold out. But in fact, it's a show about um, four prisoners of war in a German prisoner of war camp. It's a comedy. I don't understand how they ever thought that was a good idea, but it was very popular in the late 60s. And when people um, argued with him about why he did that piece, because it made Nazis funny, he said, I had to prove that black men were there in the war. And I thought that seeing me in that set of prisoners was important enough that I should do that. But it meant that he didn't do a lot of more serious films after that because of doing a comedy, which I think is sad. But anyway, Nothing But a Man deals with this really in a way we hadn't seen before. Then we get into the cool world. And this is now the first time we've seen sort of gang life. And it's not glorified. And it's not beautiful. This is a very sad version of this is all I have to make money. This is all I can do to survive, which is very post-war. And Italy, except there's no war here, except the constant war that had been fought against African Americans from the very beginning. Right? So thinking about the, the trauma of it and all those things being reflected. And always there's youth in these movies to see how that trauma affects yet the next generation and again and again, which I think I see a lot in Rome Open City. Then we get um, Melvin Van Peebles coming along, oh, sweet, sweet, sweet Beck's badass song. And suddenly we have auteurs in the black theater rebellion, and that's kind of a fascinating new idea. He breaks out into more mainstream. People know who he is. He's the beginning of a kind of a dynasty because his son Mario also becomes a filmmaker, and that's the first time that we've seen that opportunity. Um, so that's a big move. And then Claudine, I always have to credit my students. I have a list of films they watch in every of the four semesters we do the history of screenwriting, all chronological from science to modern day. And people will come to me and say, how come this film wasn't on the list? And sometimes it's a film I've never seen. Claudine was a film like that. Um, I had not seen it. It's a lovely story about a woman with several children who's on welfare, 
So again, we're seeing what happens in the cycles of poverty and when you're not allowed to get a decent job to move out of that. And she falls in love with James Earl Jones, early James Earl Jones, so pre-Star Wars. Um, and, uh, and he has to decide. He's a man with a job. Does he want to take on a family and this much obligation? And that's going to get in the way of their love story. So it's a beautiful love story that has to deal with the issues of poverty, but that, just like Marty, ugly people can be in love. In this case, people who are so... Why, why can't you have love if you're a poor person? And how come the issues you face every day are in the way? So this is a beautiful film that I have to credit my students for bringing to you, written by a male uh, husband and wife team, uh, Tina and uh, Lester Pine. But she died young, so we don't see a lot more work from her, which again is how women fall out of this, the history. Many of the women of the early days died in their 40s, and the men went on to live to their 80s and did the oral histories and talked about their own world. So the same thing, we lose Tina early on. Um, Charles Burnett wrote Killer Sheep, there you go. Um, and this is kind of an amazing, really good example of taking neorealism and bringing it into the African-American storytelling. Um, this is, in many ways, people who now look at it say this is truly a perfect example of transmitting from one culture to another, a style of film. Um, and you can see very similar, not just, and this is in the scripts, by the way, not just the visuals, <laughs> always written down, but the idea of having children deal with the rubble, the trash, the leftovers of society, not a beautiful, lovely playground as we've seen walking through town here. Um, so completely mimicking what we see in Rome Open City. Um, and also, there's this idea that there's got to be some beauty in that. One of the things that um, is considered brought into black cinema is that you still have to say that there's struggle, but you have to have hope. Otherwise, what's the point of just showing the, the struggle? So I think it's really beautiful. There are moments where the, the couple is dancing in their home. It's a very barely furnished home, but you can still see that there's love involved. So that's an element that black filmmaking brings into this neo-realistic feeling. Um, and then we get, you know, Marty gets into the, the, the Italian films and he starts kind of mimicking it, but he never quite gets there, I would say. I would say of all his films, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore gets there um, because it's a, a bleak story about a woman who is hoping to be a singer. And, but as she's driving across the country to get to her singing career, she is no money, so she has to get a job as a waitress. Many people know there was a TV show in the 70s it's based on this film, but it was much more comedic and didn't go into the sort of um, sadness and essentially the melodrama of her life. In the end, she meets Chris Christopherson. They fall in love. Do you give up your dream for the love because she has a son who needs a house and security? And so she's going to make a choice. I won't tell you what. You have to see the movie. But um, it has a bleakness to it. Again, now we're in, in the non-African-American world. So I think Marty's doing that. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't take off. There's too many other styles in the quote unquote, you know, white cinema, if you want to call it that. Um, Charles Burnett is then going to write, but not direct, Bless Their Little Hearts. And again, so his style, I think, is one of the most examples of that. Likewise, instead of the bombed out cities due to war, he's showing us the, the destructed cities where all the factories have died and the jobs have gone, and now there's nothing. So in a strange way, again, it's a different kind of war that's being um, imagined in his films. He also, like uh, The Bicycle Thief, uh, his main character comes up with an idea about selling fish and making money out of the trunk of his car, which is already a fail when you think of it, but he's trying so hard and, and he does fail because nobody wants to buy fish that hasn't been on ice. So it's the, exactly the same ending we get in The Bicycle Thieves, that it's this futility, but yet he's going to wake up tomorrow and try something else, which I think is really cool. Uh, then we get Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash. So now a female coming into that rebellious, you know, L.A. Rebellion was largely a male thing, but now Julie Dash comes to it and tries to give the real story of the Gullah family uh, using their language and their, their conversation, which is really quite beautiful. And we move over to Spike Lee. I would argue that Do the Right Thing is kind of the ultimate American, African-American neorealist film looking at the, the trouble in his area. Um, again, due to poverty and then the heat and all of that that goes on. And I think it's important to look at Spike in the new uh, museum to the academy that they built in Los Angeles, which we finally got to visit uh, after the pandemic. They have a room for directors, and I would call this writer's inspiration. I'm really tired when they call it director's inspiration. And he's a director, but you know what he got his only Oscar for? Writing. Writing, let's just remember that. 
Um, they gave a couple of writers, uh, writers, yes, writer directors, rooms to show their inspirations. And you'll see right here, Eight and a Half and Rome Open City. The man's whole career is built around what he studied at New York Film Academy uh, as the um, neorealism. And I think it takes it all back globally because, of course, he's going to become the judge. He's going to bring all his movies to cons. And so he's going to get international fame from doing this. And, of course, then he's going to become the first African-American judge in the Cannes Film Festival. And I think just seeing that circle, to me, is, is fills in this whole global idea. And while he's judge, we're going to see an award go to a Japanese film, right? something that had, I can't even remember if that had happened in the past, and then to a female, only the second female, to come up with the Palme d'Or, and that's because... I, because partially because he was on the judging team. And I think it's important to think that Jeannie and Suso and all these women in the past would be proud. And look at the judging group that year. It's split 50-50 women and men. So we're getting to a place where we're getting all the perspectives in the room. So I think that's it. There you go. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> but we yeah. started 10 minutes late, so I thought it would be just fair to give everyone the time you promised in oh, the beginning. Oh, so, that's fine. Um, questions, please. I, I have a practical question. Do you know if Tina and Lester Pine are, were African American? Yes. Yes. I have not been able to find that. I know. That's, yeah. No, that's the artist thing. Yeah, there's not much on them at all. No? Like, disappeared. He got married again, and I think, yeah, then he fall, fell off the... Radar, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's a really interesting thought and also very worthwhile to reflect on how these intercultural inspirations happen throughout the time and which uh, directors, writers are impacting on others in a different part of the world. And I, I feel that is all the time very great and, and hope uh, opens up um, a broader <coughs> view on things and a different reflection and also with postmodern cinema it's such a fun to see to whom they refer and, yeah. and what they quote and so on that's really fantastic i love that stuff exactly exactly thank you guys